Well, welcome everybody to the Cancer Patient Lab. Today we have a special guest, none other than our co-founder and CEO, Brad Power. And the reason that we are gathered here is to learn about uh, Brad's cancer journey with lymphoma and um, also to understand how he has applied lessons learned from the Cancer Patient Lab as well as services that we provide to the Cancer Patient Lab to um, address this part of his journey. And so uh, we're, we're uh, looking forward to having a lively conversation. And remember that everything in this uh, webinar is not medical advice. Um, also, if you want to um, keep yourself anonymous, you can uh, uh, remove your name from your Zoom profile, or you can go, uh, you can turn your camera off or you can leave if you if you wish to. Yeah. Um, so in any event, uh, we are uh, fortunate to have Brad. He's going to take us through a few slides that will uh, set everything up. And uh, we're looking forward to a very interactive conversation. Right. OK. Um, I assume everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, good. So I think Brian covered the intro. Um, as as he said, we want Might to- Might as well make the slide as big as possible on your screen though. Um, Just okay. drag it to the corners or- There we go. Thanks. Exactly. Better. Um, so um, the, the, the t intention here is 80% to share the pipeline that we've developed um for testing options for people and a little bit into the treatment options and then 20 percent to talk about my case as a test of that and then also get any advice that anyone might have for me um my um history is that i've been no evidence of disease for four years so i was originally diagnosed in 2018 uh with follicular lymphoma <clears throat> i went through the <clears throat> I went through the standard of care, which is a chemo cocktail called RCHOP, and then went on maintenance. Uh, we ran, we ran into the, um, the pandemic, and so we stopped the rituximab, which is because it's lymphoma, it's, it's depressing your B cells, which means you don't respond to a COVID vaccine. So we stopped it a little bit early so that I could get the COVID vaccine and, and uh, be protected from COVID. But anyway, I was no evidence of disease for four years. And then about two months ago, uh, I was having some pain in my abdomen and it seemed like the symptoms I had had five years before did a scan and it confirmed that I had um, I had a recurrence. So it basically shows up as the lymph nodes look bigger. And then they did a PET scan. So many of you probably know PET scans. It's where you get some injection of some radioactive stuff and it lights up. And it shows where the stuff is and how avid it is de determines how aggressive it is. And then the next column there of tests is a lot of stuff that I initiated based on what I've learned from the cancer patient lab. And most of these are non-standard. We'll go into what's standard. It's typically you get what's called IHC or they stain. They take the biopsy, they look at the tissue, and then they can tell uh, what kind of, of cancer it is, whether it's aggressive or not aggressive. And that's where it shows aggressive lymphoma or follicular. Follicular is a less aggressive lymphoma. And that's the determination, which can only really be made from the tissue, which is from a biopsy. I had a biopsy on my neck. Um, and it was good because there was a lymph node that was close to the surface and they could get a lot of tissue. For those of you know anything about this, and Brian can speak to this eloquently, <laughs> tissue is the issue and you want to manage your tissue and tissue can become scarce, but in my case, they got a lot of tissue from my lymph node. Um, the, um, uh, and then there, this, this layout of the, of the treatment options were ones that were presented to me by my oncologist at my first, at the first consult after we were going over the, the fact that it had recurred. And so the testing we're doing is gonna help us determine which of these we pursue I'm meeting with my oncologist, Dr. Merriman at Dana-Farber tomorrow, and that's where we'll be laying out, I think, the treatment plan. Brian, you want to take this, describe this slide? Sure. 
So, you know, one of the things that we offer uh, patients that come to the cancer patient lab is really um, kind of like a pipeline um, of access to various services. And, and this is a, a kind of like a process flow which describes what the patient gets and how the cancer patient lab supports them through the process. And I think this is important to talk about because um, some of you who may be on the phone only know us through the weekly webinars that we do. But in fact, um, we've had many patients who have gone through and used um, uh, particularly diagnostic uh, services from our partners. And so this is just a, a quick overview of, of, you know, what we offer. And so, you know, this is really meant to describe the relationship that the patient has with the physician. And when you come to the cancer patient lab, you join with us, you get access to the community, you can share your medical records if you want, and then you're going to receive guidance on um, basic testing. And there's, and we'll talk a little bit more about who the test providers are. Um, and then you, you take those results back along with treatments to your physician, you get additional tests or you get treatment um, and you get additional tests as appropriate. Um, and sort of the journey kind of continues. I'm not going to go through each you know, element of this, but you kind of get the idea. And I can tell you that I've used this pipeline uh, for myself several times. So as some of you may know, I did this maybe like, I think a year and a half, two years ago, where I had 21 different treatment options from at the time, three different service providers, uh, where they were looking at my DNA and my RNA primarily. I think we got into proteomics as well. No, that was the second round. In any event, um, you know, so I have gone through this and I can tell you that it's really, really important to particularly go through the diagnostics because what I learned is that it uncovered treatment options that really weren't part of the discussion. When you start looking at um, targets that arise from the results of your sequencing, it opens up doors. Um, so for example, for me, I have advanced prostate cancer and I learned that I had a moderate expression of HER2. Well, HER2, as we all know, is associated with breast cancer, um, not commonly uh, associated with, with, uh, with prostate cancer, but that opened up a discussion about HER2 being a target that we could go after with a known drug. So in any event, um, this is just a reminder uh, for all patients and caregivers that are part of the Cancer Patient Lab to that we have a pipeline and that you should really take advantage of it um, when you need it. So if you and, go to the next. Yeah, ahead. if I could just mention too, Rick, 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 I'm looking at Rick's photo here and he got B7. He, he identified B7H3, I believe, from RNA sequencing, which he did, which is not a standard test, is, is another example. And I'm Absolutely. on a B7H3 clinical trial right now and so far responding. <laughs> right. And you would not have known, you would not have known had you not gone through these, these tests. Right. Uh, I, I would have known to a, a generalized degree, but, you know, we analyzed the RNA-seq data and it was wonderful that I was expressing in the 98%, so super high expression of B7H3, so a good match, not just a shot in the dark. Uh, it was wonderful to have that confidence because like you, I had all these choices and uh, to have one that was actually molecularly guided was, uh, important and so far i'm responding uh so we'll we'll see yeah let, let me i'm uh, sorry brad just to, just to go back uh, i won't monopolize this conversation but if you just go back uh one slide it's possible if not i'll just speak to it um there's sort of like this iterative process you see oh get get additional tests you know so as we all know and of course it depends upon the cancer type um but when you're subjected to various treatments you're your cancer changes. And so that's why it's important if you can to get additional diagnostics. Um, and I just went through a process with Boston Gene and we reviewed some of the results yesterday or all the results yesterday. It's just absolutely amazing. We're gonna do a separate, a separate session on that. But my cancer has changed um, over the course of the past seven years, seven and a half years. And so 
that means that what was working previously um, is not going to work going forward. However, there are other targets that we can go after. And that's why this is, you know, uh, for certain cancers, it's a it's an iterative process where you, you're, you're constantly getting more data and you're making decisions as you go. So, OK. So, um, you know, it, it's also important. Brad and I talked about this oh, several years ago about, you know, kind of like writing down what are the things that are really important to you as a cancer patient um, as you go through your journey? And he he wrote down some of these and 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 some of these, you know, we share. Um, but first is, you know, as, as Bryce Olson said, mo data is mo beta, <laughs> which we just talked about. Um, it does identify treatment options and often ones that that may not even be known. Um, the notion that, you know, I'll be here again, tests are not just for this treatment, but for future uh, treatments and treatment strategy, right? So what you're doing is you're sort of like laying out a menu of different options, and then you're hopefully working with your uh, medical oncologist to figure out a sequence. And that sequence is going to change, again, depending upon, um, you know, uh, uh, what additional tests you get. Tissue, um, as we all know, tissue is critical. Um, for many of us, it's it's hard to get tissue, uh, and so it's it's really important that that you maximize the utility of that tissue. From a treatment pr uh, principles perspective, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, we do like this idea of evolutionary uh, biology, which has really come from Bob Gattenby, big proponents of that. Um, you know, combined treatments um, include uh, immune system um, boosting therapies. Uh, invest in second opinions, favor immunotherapies, you kind of get it. The point is, is that for you as a, as a cancer patient or caregiver, I think it's important to have sort of like this bedrock of principles that are going to guide your journey. And if you write them down, you kind of come back to them. They, they will evolve as you go through your journey, but it's, it's nice to have it. And and this document will be made available to everyone. So this could be your starter document and then you kind of come up and customize your, uh, for yourself. And then um, I'll, I'll wrap up my section here by just talking a little bit about, you know, who our preferred testing service providers are. Um, I know that Michael Hensley is on here, Michael, or at least I saw you before, hopefully you're still on. Uh, we just had an amazing session. I had an amazing session with Boston Jean yesterday and Michael's part of that. They do a, a variety of different reports from one of the most um, in-depth tumor portrait reports that I've seen, and I've seen many of them. They've done immune profiling, uh, spatial phenotyping. Um, a, another company that we work with, uh, Gitta, is, is here, Genomic Expression. They do an RNA interpretation. Um, Brad's going to talk a little bit about uh, Tony Latai and his team at Dana-Farber. Um, M-Probe has been an amazing partner with... Uh, the cancer patient lab, of course, they do proteomics. And I can tell you that proteomics is really what um, highlighted her too for me. And so that was really uh, an important um, um, test for, for, my, um, for my treatment options. The Nagurney Cancer Institute does functional testing. They do require fresh tissue. Uh, they're based in uh, Orange County, California. Ascension, which does functional testing using organoids. Uh, Tempus, um, Rick referred to them earlier. Um, we did a whole bunch of uh, uh, transcriptomic analysis um, with them uh, for, for both himself and as well as me. Um, and then, of course, Trevera. Trevera, who spoke here, I think, maybe two months ago, uh, discussing their very unique approach to functional testing. So these are all service providers that you have at your fingertips and um, that we uh, have worked with and that we endorse and that we think are, are really, um, you know, best in class. And so it's just a, a short list. Okay. And then uh, I'll pick up from here. So once you get all the data, then you need to make sense of it and prioritize it. Um, and we have a number of service, <laughs> service providers here as well that we work with. Uh, Cancer Commons is our close partner. Uh, they have PhD microbiologists. I think both Adrian and Emma are on the call today. Um, they look at the medical records and the history and the the genomic information, 
and then identify treatments or clinical trials. It's all handcrafted at this point. Their intentions are to have more AI, but it's it's just amazing detailed information. Um, and they do it for free. It's a it's a nonprofit. We should be donating to them, um, but they do it for free. So it's like having a, a doctor in your corner. Um, I put Emma Stillman. I tried to use Dolly to come up with making her a guardian angel. So that's that's what that that image is. Yeah, love it. Yay, <laughs> Emma. Yeah, Emma's been with me every step of the way. Every time I get a test, I get a pathology report, and you get a pathology report, and I could show it. It's like it's impossible for a human to read. Like doctors can read it, pathologists can read it, but humans can't read it. <laughs> your average layperson. But Emma can translate it. Say these are the key points. And then this, the cytogenics report comes out and she tells me what the key points are out of that. And then the, in every one of these tests, it's like it requires an interpretation. Uh, and I'll show you the functional testing as well. And Emma has been there every step of the way within 24 hour response, telling me what this means. <laughs> and if I, if she didn't, if I didn't have her, I would be, I, I don't think I would be useful because the intention we have is to be a co-pilot, be a partner with your medical team, to be bringing ideas and to be, you know, able to participate, put your finger on the scale for the things that are important to you, whether it's quality of life, whether it's you want to try to hit a home run versus hitting singles, whatever it might be. The patient has a view, has a point of view and has something to say in this, but you can't do it if you don't know what the options are and, and what the tests are saying. And so Emma is that translator that allows me to be a, an active participant. Uh, Massive Bio provides clinical trials, also free. You give them your medical records access, and they're very they're very service oriented. And then they gave me a list of clinical trials. I'll share that with you. Um, CureMatch uh, takes the, your your biomarkers and gives you uh, drug combinations. I haven't taken advantage of that because I'm still waiting to get my onco panel results or the Boston Gene results um, from my latest uh, biopsy. Genomic expression, as, as um, Brian mentioned, is uh, Gita's on the call here. They do analysis mostly focused on RNA. And then Shepard takes um, uh, RNA data and then does interpretation on it. Um, and again, because I don't have that data yet, I haven't used them yet, but but expect to. Um, so they I just covered raw files too. Sorry, just one quick thing on on Shepard. They will work with whoever does your sequencing to uh, import the raw files, uh, FASTQ files, I think, um, to then put it into their algorithms to identify treatment options. Um, so this I covered most of this already, or Brian did as well. These are the the main testing services that I've taken advantage of. The so Dana Farber provides some basic services um, that are kind of standard. The CT scan and the PET scan I mentioned already, the IHC I mentioned, they are going to do a, an onco panel looking at the major genes and, and, and how they show up. You already see some of that from the IHC. So classically with lymphoma at CD19 and CD20, but there's more detail behind that. Um, they uh, they couldn't uh, do RNA sequencing for me, but Boston Gene will be doing RNA sequencing. Um, and M probe is in in process; they're getting tissue, and um, it's also waiting to uh, involve others be, be behind that. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly flash some of the test results because it's a lot of detail, and and you don't really care or know about this, but there's flow cytometry, which is they take, and uh, as you can see in the little picture, they run the cells by and they count them, I guess. And so I have, as I mentioned, CD19 and CD20, which is typical for lymphoma. The pathology report key thing there is that is it's follicular lymphoma, not a diffuse B cell lymphoma, uh, which is a more aggressive cancer. So there was that fork in the road are you on the on the less aggressive cancer or the more aggressive cancer? I'm on the less aggressive, which then points to a particular set of treatment options. And then the cytogenics get into some detailed genomic analysis, which again is beyond me, but um, these are other indicators that, that can uh, guide treatment options. They made, again, they made sense to Emma. And um, they, there's some, for example, it says BL, BCL2, that's um, B cell lymphoma two. And at that particular gene, uh, there are some BCL2 inhibitors, which we'll, which we'll point out next. 
without going into the details, this is this is functional testing. So this is a test that most patients don't get. This is a research use, typically a research test only. You have to ask for this. And you don't want to go into the details, but they tested 10 drugs at different concentrations, which you can see from left to right. And the ones that are on the right are having a bigger response. And so all other things being equal, this tells you um, which drugs you might want to choose because they're more effective. There is a, we've had five sessions on functional testing, including one with Tony Latai that explains the technology, this dynamic BH3 testing, we explains how that all works. But from a patient's point of view, it's just more information that would tell you that, hey, maybe one of these ones on the right is a more better candidate than some of the ones on the left. And the analysis and interpretation here goes into that kind of analysis. Um, the Boston gene test results, we've talked about, Brian talked about them a lot. I'm very much looking forward to getting those test results, but it takes four weeks. And so unfortunately, the test results will be coming in after I have my consultation with my doctor tomorrow. So we'll be talking about whether we want to wait to get those uh, test results and actually use them to influence treatment decisions uh, or whether we know enough to go ahead and, and decide on what my treatment will be and then maybe use these for confirmation when they come in. Um, these are the... This Could is you the... go over that timeline a little bit? That was interesting. Like, that's kind of... I don't know, if, if you don't mind. No, yeah. So, so I had my biopsy on January 4th. And in my simple mind, from the time I got my biopsy and the tissue, like it would be go, it would go out the next day in overnight mail, you know, to Boston Gene. But no, <laughs> they they um, are waiting to get the confirmation and they want to see the pathology report. And I don't know why that's so, but they do. Maybe it's because they want to be sure that the tissue is there and useful. And then once the pathology report is in, which I saw because it showed up in the patient portal, then I sent them a message saying, you know, here's the pathology report. Um, by the way, I don't get an email when the pathology report hits my portal. I have to be checking it every day, but that's another story. And I, I only found out about a couple of days after. But as soon as they knew that the pathology report was in, they then co contacted Dana-Farber's pathology department, but then nothing happened, which Brian can tell his story if he wants to about how the pathology department doesn't always communicate well with the outside. Um, and then it was only when I followed up with them and said, hey, have you gotten the, the tissue yet? And they said, no, we haven't. Let us follow up with Dr. Merriman's office. And once they got Dr. Merriman's office talking to the pathology lab, then that sprung into action. But there was a week lost in there, as you can see. So, you know, there's like two or three weeks there that if I was a process innovation consultant, which I am, <laughs> then I would look at that and say, like, why couldn't we do that in a day instead of three weeks? <laughs> so, and then once, you know, once the tissue hits Boston Gene, I have every confidence that they'll turn it around in their normal time, which is like 10 to 12 days or whatever it is, you know, something like that. So it works, that's that's how it ends up being four weeks instead of, I would have thought like a week or two, which would have put it inside the window of uh, being able to be used with my uh, doctor for treatment planning. I wanted to emphasize, you know, for Brian, I think uh, the tissue just never got lost or never got sent or, you know, it was like ridiculous. Brian is like queuing it up as best he can. He's going under anesthesia and, uh, you know, that just doesn't get sent. And we were emphasizing tissue is the issue. Um, and it's just... It just seems I, I've never had it, uh, this on a, you know, uh, on metastases. Hopefully I'll be able to follow up with a similar path that you guys are going down, but it seems like very disorganized. So. Yeah, there's a lot of room for um, process innovation and process improvement when it comes to managing tissue. <laughs> the, I think we've had at least one session on it. Um, the uh, the cliff notes are available. Okay, so um, Cancer Commons, uh, again, Emma put together a report with, she basically had two versions. One was if I had the more aggressive cancer, one was if I had the less aggressive cancer. This is the list 
for the less aggressive cancer. And one of the questions she asked, which I hadn't even thought about, I just assumed Dana Farber would have everything that I would need. Uh, but she said, are you willing to travel? And I said, oh yeah, I suppose so. Like for the right deal, I could, you know, I could go to New York. Uh, I have family in New York. I could, you know, stay there. Um, and so we expanded the lens and that opened up more possibilities. This first one that that is the preferred one is a uh, a couple of um, drugs. Uh, rituximab is a common one for all lymphomas. It's uh, I think it's a monoclonal antibody. Lenalidomide is a, a a common second line treatment. It's an immune system enhancer, I guess. And the third one is a bispecific. A bispecific um, grabs. It's an immunotherapy. It grabs on the CD20 on one side which is the cancer, and then it grabs onto CD3, which is a T cell, and says, hey, you guys, let's get together, and then C T cell kill cancer cell. And so adding that um, that bispecific uh, increases the, the study base you know, duration of the response. And then Emma looked at some of the, those, like the MIC, uh, a, a rearrangement or something and said that's probably this this extra this extra thing this boost would be good for you um so uh that's that's this the story is there so the, the, this is the you know I, i'm now armed and and will bring these suggestions or these ideas to uh, my doctor and he's asked me what i've heard from cancer commons and here from massive bio um massive bio had the same number one treatment recommendation that Emma had, um, and a bunch of other ones, some of which uh, at least Emma looked at, again, my 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 angel <laughs> looked at it, interpreted and said, I'm not so keen on those BTK ones that are on the list, but the, the other ones with the bispecific are interesting. Um, and I had a subsequent conversation about one of the other drugs, which is typically used in CLL um, and um, is is uh, now uh, is, is looks like it would be a, I would be a good responder to venetoclax. I see Frank raised his hand. Frank, did you want to comment? Oh, I, I was just curious. Um, you know, when you talk about not liking the you know liking the bi specific versus not liking some of the other recommendations, um, was that just based on like early readouts from the studies uh, that were going on, like you know, or like you know, kind of what, what you're thinking about efficacy from like a disease biology side. Yeah, there's probably two or three answers to that. The first is, as you, as you know, because I know you're, you're, you're right up on this, um, blood cancers have been the best responders to things like CAR T. Yes. So, yeah. you know, so uh, the immunotherapies, the way it works is that these immunotherapies are moving from like third and fourth line therapies to then third line therapies to second line therapies to first line therapies. And the way you access them is through clinical trials. Yeah. So in general, immunotherapy is good because they work well in blood cancers because they're systemic and there's a lot of stuff floating around, I guess, in the blood. So there's exactly. that's, that's like principle one, immunotherapy is good. And then uh, Emma is diving into, I'm not, but Emma is diving into the details, which says, Hey, there's, I don't know if you all saw, but there's some, some issues with CAR T, which were just in the press in the last week <clears> that said <throat> some people got cancer from the CAR T, you know, so, and then Emma's also looking at the efficacy of the CAR T and saying it's not as good as the bispecific. The trial results on the bispecifics look more, more effective than the trial results on the CAR T. Oh, okay. Well, let's, let's prioritize that. So it's, it's it's mostly yeah. Did you want to comment? Yeah, it's just that CAR T uh, um, way down the road for you maybe will be not needed, and so even for the high grade follicular lymphoma that is like in say fourth line of treatment, there is now a debate what's better. There is still no answer if CAR T are better than by specific, but there are two top op options which are not available for the first recurrence, except by specifics are now, because they're obviously kind of easier to use and because the, they work really well in uh, DLBCL and there are results in follicular lymphoma and so on. So it's a good option. And if you think about CAR-T down the road, sometimes 
I think it's better to avoid chemotherapy for now. Yeah, I think that's the third thing is, is uh, chemo. We know what the side effects of that are. I think the side effects would be less desirable. I mean, it, it kind of carpet bombs your immune system. You lose your hair, you know, all, all the things that go with chemo. Uh, I think the side effects, there, there are different side effects for immunotherapies, like inflammation and cytokine storm storms and what have you yeah. but yeah. uh but uh you know the, the chemo I, on net i think the general impression i have is that the side effects from immunotherapies are less i know that the lenalidomide a friend a, who's a doctor told me that's very well tolerated i had the rituximab before that's well tolerated at least by me and so now you know it's it's looking at those as, as opposed to um chemo no, that, yeah, that makes I, sense. Oh, yeah, sorry. I I think I wrote you uh, that I think that your doctor may just want to go ahead with um, R2, which is rituximab and lenalidomide, because you are not, your lymphoma luckily is not high grade and so on. And that's a standard of treatment and it works really, really well. It works much better than reintroducing uh, rituximab with chemotherapy as a second line of treatment. Um, but I would I would be a little more aggressive, and with the uh, available by specific in a trial, it's it's a no brainer if you can join the trial. Yeah, yeah. I'm concerned about the the subpopulation of uh, your lymphoma cells have meek rearrangement, which is not a good prognostic marker. Right. So it's right. better to hit it early, I think. Hit it early. And, yeah, okay. And hit it harder. And that's another principle we have, which is um, a combination. Combinations are better, like they're more effective. They have more durable responses. And so rather than, as, as Emma's saying, using R2, which is lenalidomide plus rituximab, use R2 plus this bispecific. So now you're getting three drugs. And that just gives you a uh, hit it high, hit it medium, hit it low, you know, kind of is the way, at least the way I look at it. Yeah, that, that makes, that makes a ton of sense. That, that thanks for the explanation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the last slide and I'll turn this back over to Brian. This is kind of, um, you know, what's the call to action? Uh, what should you as patients um, learn or, you know, what might you want to learn or adopt from, what Brian and I have been talking about um, in terms of what you can do for yourself, what you can do for others and for the system. Brian, did you wanna take this? Yeah, um, so this is something that I, I feel really strongly about, which is that um, you know, standard of care is only gonna get you so far. Um, and it's really incumbent upon the patient to, um, to push their care team I think you have to work with your care team or a care team doesn't have to be the one that you're currently with um, to leverage all of the diagnostics that are available. And one of the challenges is that many uh, medical oncologists don't know about the tests or they don't know how to interpret them. And it's really important that um, the patients get involved to create that bridge. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, and, and that's sort of like what translational medicine is, is how do you take all this amazing science that is in, in many ways, it's, you know, it's proven and it works, take it from the lab and get it to the patient's bedside. Um, but there's a lot of barriers that prevent that, that uh, process from happening. Um, but the role that the patient has is really, really important because we do have a, a, a powerful voice um, in this, and at the end of the day, we are responsible for our own decisions. We can get second opinions, right? So, um, it's, it's critical to have data-driven decisions. And when you have diagnostics and advanced diagnostics, like the ones that we're talking about, where we're getting in transcript, transcriptomics or proteomics, um, or just even interpretation, uh, of your DNA, uh, it can illuminate treatment options that weren't formally part of the discussion. Uh, and I, I know that there are several, several patients that are on this call 
um, who've gone through this process and um, and it's worked for them. It's, it's worked to um, identify new treatment options. Um, the other point here is, you know, helping others. So not only do I feel like I have an obligation to help myself, but also to um, to push the boundary for other patients. But um, we hope and we think that that all the members here, whether you're a patient or you're a caregiver, are also interested in doing that. And the, the notion about helping the system in this translational medicine, which is what I just talked about, um, it's all hands on deck. Um, if we if we don't make our voices heard, then it's just going to make the adoption of um, these diagnostics that much slower. And we just don't have time. And so um, so anyway, so, so that's really what we wanted to kind of um, share with you today as Brad was going through you know, his new diagnosis, unfortunately, he's no longer, you know, uh, NED. And now he has to put all this knowledge that he's acquired to his own case. And as we kind of reflect, or as he reflected on his case, and, and he and I talked about it, um, you know, there's a lot of components of Cancer Patient Lab that are, are helping to guide him in his treatment. And so we hope that that's um, true for uh, the other patients and caregivers that are on this call. Um, and I think with that, I'll open it up for questions and comments. And I think that they can be, you know, really uh, relevant to either Brad's specific case or to, um, to the Cancer Patient Lab and how we can improve what we're currently doing. So I will open it up for Q&A. We like it if you use the raise hand feature um, and then we'll call on you. Go ahead, Rick. You had on one of your slides um, a $10,000 or something and declined. And then I saw uh, in the chat, uh, are any of these covered by insurance in these advanced testing options? Um, you know, that's a barrier. Uh, well, you want to got $10,000 cash, you know, uh, so in any comments there, Brian should talk about, we we've cut special deals with like M probe will do the proteomics for free. Um, for example, I think genomic expression will, uh, Gita can comment on this, but I think they're free so that this, when we're working with startups, they are very willing to uh, do things for free because it gives them data that allows them to then publish results and make their test uh, commercially available. So if they're at that stage. Um, Boston Gene was kind enough to say, uh, submit it to your insurance and um, if they deny it, uh, we'll make you whole. Um, but that was a special deal. So we have some special deals that are unique to Cancer Patient Lab and that we have individually. Um, Brian can can refer those, but most most of the tests that we have uh, are are free uh, to the patient. Is that Brian? How would you characterize? Yeah, I, I think I think you got it. Like Travera, you know, as another, they do the functional testing right. Um, they are free for our patients, um, and you know, just as you explained with Boston Gene, I think that you know, um, some companies like even like Tempest have come to me and said, hey, you know, run this through your insurance. I've never had to pay anything to Tempest for any of the sequencing that that they do. Uh, I, I know, Frank, you're, you're on the phone. You can probably speak to that a little bit um, better than I can, but I've oh. never had to pay anything and I've done, you know, I mean, they're, they're being paid by, you know, big pharma. And so, you know, they got, they got other sources of income than, than from the patients directly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm not affiliated with Tempest anymore, but actually yeah. just this morning, they announced that um, the tests are, I think, now generally covered under uh, all Umana plans. Um, because like a lot of the testing providers that are, you know, I, I think like the startup versus like established testing provider dichotomy is like pretty spot on. Like in the startups, you know, it's it's a big thing for them to get uh, get tests so that they can demonstrate, you know, efficacy and accuracy of the readouts. Um, whereas for like a lot of the more established, um, you know, testing labs, uh, if they aren't well covered by insurance, they are pushing very heavily, whether it's the major payers, whether it's going Medicare, um, 
I do that that is probably like a good place to like shop around a little bit if you are you know shop around colloquially because there are differences in uh what tests are covered you know by what disease like what testing providers and what tests are covered for which diseases and which payers um you know, in, in some cases, like if you have comparable testing providers that that could give you the same readout, um, that that's a good place to just do a little bit of comparative research. Good advice. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in translational medicine, a lot of the tests we'd like to get like the multiplex immunofluorescence, which is very cutting edge. Um, the, the first challenge is finding a CLIA certified lab that a patient can get to to get that test, um, which we've been discussing with Boston Gene, for example. Um, but then, you know, on, on the backside, uh, you know, what does it cost? Because it is new and it's typically only used in a research environment. There's a question that came in from uh, Bob Cha. Has anyone tried using the same test twice to ensure the data uh, was near identical in both cases? Um, so Bobcha, I have been sequenced um, for uh, several times. Um, so I've had three surgeries uh, that yielded tissue for sequencing. All three of those were sequenced by Tempest um, and they've identified certain alterations. Uh, just within the past two months, I've been very, working very closely with Michael Hensley from Boston Gene, who's on this call. Um, to do some extensive testing, they pulled new tissue um, from my first uh, first surgery and from my last surgery. Um, so both of these uh, were already sequenced by Tempest. Now, keep in mind, these are fresh cuts of tissue that we just did on these samples. Uh, but what is interesting is there was concordance with the between Tempest and Boston Gene on my 2016 rece uh, resection. Uh, but there were, there was some overlap, but there were some differences as well between Tempest and Boston Gene on my surgery from last year, which is, which is interesting. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, you know, uh, I don't know, Michael, if you want to add anything to that. Well, I was just going to uh, add some feedback, you know, one, Tissue is probably the bane of my existence um, because it's so tough. Um, we always want the most recent tissue, but there are many times when tissue will be um, have 80% purity on the on the first cuts. And by the time we're getting it in our lab, we're down to like our threshold of like 30%. So really what happens is a lot of IFC stains slides are, are cut for various markers. Um, and so this can really affect the quality. There's many times when uh, tissue is on the verge of exhaustion. So we may be only successful with the DNA extraction versus DNA and RNA extraction. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different things that come into play here, but obviously all of us have uh, very important quality metrics in place to ensure the accuracy of our calls um, that we deliver into the report. So, you know, but if, if, the, if the most current tissue is exhausted, we will go back in time a little bit. But obviously, um, you know, various treatments, uh, immunotherapy or chemotherapy or whatnot, can certainly change uh, certain markers. And, you know, in the, in the expression levels as well as in the microenvironment. So, um, you know, I, but as uh, Frank said, you know, all of us have robust financial assistance programs for patients. You know, we built a special one at MD Anderson because everybody at MD Anderson usually comes with previous testing. So we will attempt to build insurance company, but some insurance companies may not pay for additional testing because they've just paid for something and they may have to, we have to make to show that the patients had progression or this is on new anatomic site or whatnot. That's for us to worry about but we ensure that the patients aren't gonna be financially you know, um, liable for because the insurance denies. And so I think most of the strong companies have these programs. Um, and the other question about um, doing multiple tests, 
when the patients qualify through our financial assistance, we will do testing at whatever specimen they have. But if they do have progression or a future biopsy, we will do additional testing on that um, free of charge to the patient as well. And I couldn't agree with you guys more. One of the most frustrating parts about being an innovative company is these technologies are incredibly expensive, like MXIF, and finding payers to support this new testing is very difficult. So it does limit the ability for patients to get this unless it's you know out of pocket or under a research trial. Uh, but we're, you know, I think everyone's trying to move that needle to show the utility, but like in Brian's case, maybe one of these wasn't like the greatest clinical utility. It's combining these, this multi-omics approach to really personalize his care where you find the greatest utility. And that's very hard to share with providers and get, you know, them on board. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's moving. It's moving at snail's, snail's pace, but it's mo definitely moving forward. Well, we're gonna we're gonna change that trajectory, Michael. Here, real 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 quick. <laughs> um, Boston Gene, if I can just plug them and the work that Michael did, because Michael really spearheaded this. Just did an amazing job um, grabbing my original prostatectomy, twenty sixteen tissue, and then um, a met resection from twenty twenty two, and then they did a tumor evolution report, which kind of shows all the various treatments that I've been under and then how my uh, my cancer has changed over that seven year period of time uh, and um, how, how treatments um, also have changed too. So uh, there's other stuff that they did, which was absolutely amazing. We're going to have a whole session or two around Boston Gene here coming up very soon. Um, but I will just say that, uh, that these guys are really um, on the cutting edge of uh, of uh, advanced diagnostics. And, and everything on that front part, we do all the time for patients. So if we lock you in with financial assistance, which vast majority of patients are covered at 100% because it's not only income-based, but it's situational-based, like travel expenses, debt, retired, so forth. But we do we can do all of that, what Brian just mentioned. Um, fantastic. And then Brad, you know, I'll say that many pathology labs severely limit our communication because of just the volume of reference lab send outs, not just Boston Gene, but everybody. And um, when the date of collection of a biopsy, a lot of times we won't start following up on that until about three or four days after that, because the pathologist has to get the tissue sample, sign it out, do all the write up. And then we work on that. But, um, you know, Usually the first issue we get pretty quickly, um, but you know we've had turnaround times in 15 days. We have turnaround times in three months. You know when we're requesting multiple tissues just because of low tumor content, and um, you know again it's all about tissue and it's all about just you know getting it in the right time. So um, it's tough. It's a lot of moving parts. Uh, Frank, you got your hand up. Oh, I, I was just going to piggyback on the, some of the comments Michael was making around testing accuracy. Um, it does get like somewhat hard to look, you know, look at results between two tests taken at different time points because it's hard to say what is, you know, what is uh, con concordance versus like changes in the tumor itself. Um, generally speaking, two, you know, two tests that come from the same timeline will have fairly high concordance. You run into issues around, um, you know, the tissue as, as Michael was kind of pointing out, especially like when you get tumor tissue that is more or less contaminated, that can cause, uh, you know, definite changes. And you will get, um, you will fairly consistently run into some comparison chain, like comparison issues. If you go from like, one testing modality to another testing modality. Like for instance, if you look at liquid biopsy versus solid tumor testing, that's not necessarily a bug. In some cases that can actually be a pretty good feature of using those two orthogonal testing modalities. Um, but it's it's definitely very situational. Um, there, there are some cases where people are kind of you know, using two testing modalities like solid tumor and liquid biopsy 
and kind of oring all the results, you know, essentially combining all the results together. And that's giving them like much, a uh, much wider range of therapies that they have access to. Um, so it's somewhat, somewhat situational, but overall the, the tests generally have, have very good concordance, I would say. I just wanted to plug it before we go to Bob Shaw, I just wanted to throw in, I, I was at a conference and I asked someone from foundation medicine, you know, the cost curve is going down on DNA sequencing. So now you can get it more often. Would you also expand the number of genes you look at? Cause typically an onco panel is 300 or 400 genes. Would you go to 500, 600, 700 in the future? Or would you go to whole exome? And he said, "More, it's there's more value from getting different tests than getting more more of the same test." So, just as Frank was saying, maybe a liquid biopsy looks at what's floating around in the blood, uh, gives you a different lens on the same information. If you saw my reports, you know you've got the cytogenics, the flow cytometry, and the you know looking at something under a slide. So. Uh, I think energy into multiple tests would be a principle to give a more complete story of what's going on. Um, Emma was pointing out for me, there's a MIC rearrangement. Well, you only see that on the cytogenics report, you know, so uh, rather than worrying about same test, multiple vendors, uh, maybe we should be worrying about multiple tests and, and seeing how we can uh, get new information from different kinds of tests. Bapcha, you had something? I think his, his question was answered. Um, okay. So yeah, I, um, I, I can help a little bit about that. So Bapcha, you know, we, we will report findings that are uh, focused on that primary diagnosis that have targeted therapies, but we also will report findings in the Boston D tumor portrait that are uh, of known significance for a positive prognosis or an inferior prognosis, um, as well as something that would demonstrate um, a lack of efficacy with a certain uh, therapy. So we, we do both targeted for, uh, or biomarkers for targeted therapies as well as prognostic capabilities. We are just about at the end of the hour. Um, any any other questions, comments, anyone would like to have? Yeah, Saeed mentioned oh, go ahead. that uh, reproducible re results. And this, this is an interesting thing. I, I have found with a good lab, I was at Human Longevity, um, we sequenced a particular individual 78 times whole genome sequencing, not only whole exome, uh, to uh, validate uh, migration of chemistry from version two to version three chemistry. So we we're moving our whole platform chemistry and we want to validate it. So we sequenced an individual 78 times and the concordance was spectacular. Uh, so this... Um, Reproducible results isn't because you're feeding the same data into the same platform. It's it's like the, the data, it's like Michael said, it's the data the quality is different when the lab received it or the chemistries are different. Uh, but if you have a good lab that has uh, got high quality input, um, th those results should be pretty damn good um you know just being someone who's been under the hood uh my observation is this this is not shaky stuff this is pretty repeatable uh it was amazing like uh most of the variants that we saw 78 times 78 out of 78 okay some 76 but it it, it wasn't a shaky deal uh not in our lab uh, thought I'd mention it. I, I trust results, <laughs> you know, from yeah, a good. Just uh, this is uh, this. I just uh, this is true, actually, Rick. I, I yeah, your point is on target. It means if you can control all the variable, only yeah, right. But the right. the problem here is 
uh, we need to gener generalize our finding for other patients. You know, this is a problem. It means when, say, you want to get the biomarkers from 1,000 patients, then use it for other patients, then we have a problem. That's the major issue. But your yeah, point I, is valid. So, so I would also just say, you know, we're trying to make data-driven decisions and sequencing and these advanced diagnostics that we're talking about are at the heart of these data-driven decisions. Um, and I agree with what Brad said earlier, which is, you know, um, if you can get different tests to provide a complementary view of what your existing tests are, I think generally that's a good thing. Um, but where things start to get interesting is when you may not have concordance or you may have different data uh, or different results coming from tests and you have to draw conclusions across different types of tests, then you get into this equation of art and science. And, um, you know, uh, if I'm, I'm about ready to go through that process again. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd rather have as much data to make my decision as possible. And having yeah. multiple different views of my cancer, I think at the end is only going to result in better decisions for me, but also learnings. So even if it doesn't work for me, hopefully somebody else is gonna be able to benefit from whatever we learn going through a rig rigorous data-driven process or as rigorous as we can possibly make it so yeah. yeah it's it's true when having some data and some knowledge is better than uh, having nothing uh, just adding one point just as based on my personal experience the best method i found on all those data set i saw is those coming from single cell which you have the from the same patient you have the cell the normal cell, if possible, and the cancer cell. Comparing these two groups, you should get the best result of understanding the nature of your disease. That's just based on my analysis. I think, <clears throat> uh, I'll just make a point. I know we are out of time, but uh, um, you know, one of the choke points in the process that we haven't discussed and you know the industry that needs to address is most of the onco teams just don't have time to pay attention to the flood of data that we can actually bring to them and it's a it's almost like a you know 2080 rule or 1090 that 10 percent of the researchers will be all over it but 90 percent of the the oncologists just like this this is a lot of data i i really don't know where what what to do with that and how to make it actionable. And that's a choke point in the industry that needs to get, get resolved and understood. And uh, we need to figure out how to make that that more effective uh, as well, because that's the, you know, even working with the, you know, National Cancer Institutes, I have, I have seen that, that issue that, okay, great, we got all the data. Not sure where we go with that, right? So, so there's a lot to be translated in that space. Yay, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody for, um, for your,